There are those who believe the sudden hostilities between the Core Alliance and the Sarn Star Empire were unexpected. Those who have engaged Imperial forces at Rho Theta, Lunar 6-1, and now El Rey know better. The strike point, Siege Island. The Alliance fleet is well aware an attack on populated planets could happen with as little as 90 seconds advance warning. Dragonkind's most lethal battleship and its most ruthless warlord, known as He Who Slew Nine with a Single Blade, are tasked with a simple mission, hunt down and destroy mankind's warriors. The leaders of the Core Alliance have pushed their enemies too far. Payback is coming, and it will fall from the skies on wings stained with human blood. Introducing Shane Lachlan Black's newest and most ambitious series in the Starship's universe, featuring an all-new story cycle complete with bonus chapters and an alternate ending. The Siege Island Special Edition Combination Audiobook and Digital Collection, available exclusively at getabook.today. The order is given. This time it ends with either victory or annihilation. Getabook.today presents Vendetta. Book 2 in the Destroy All Starships series by Shane Lachlan Black, copyright 2021. Chapter 5 I don't get it, Cap. This is exactly the kind of thing we saw aboard San Cristobal, except these ships weren't crewed. Jason Hunter was busy with his handheld torch. He and his survey team were aboard the battlecruiser Dunbrody, and what they had encountered so far bordered on the supernatural. The altar, as the emergency repair crews had been calling it, was a good 15 feet tall. The decorations on its face were unnerving to say the least. It was a dark crimson color with lighter tracery along the edges and carve-outs. It looked thoroughly out of place in an electronics calibration lab. Is it possible this was built and then abandoned on purpose? Zoni asked. Looks like standard construction, basic metal materials, machining, smooth surfaces, Hunter replied. Wonder what its function is supposed to be. If it's the same as the one aboard San Cristobal, its function is as evil as the thing that was standing on it, Moo said in a contentious tone. What thing? Zoni asked. Moo pointed. We were at the doors. Except on San Cristobal, they were twice as high. The whole corridor outside them had been rebuilt. The ceilings were a good thirty feet above the deck. The doors were five times as tall as they were wide, and they were bleeding. Say again, Colonel? Hunter asked, lowering his light. Something was spilling out of the eyes of the relief carvings on the doors. It wasn't coming from anywhere we could see. It wasn't mechanical. It was draining into the floor somehow. A bunch of crew members were screaming at us to stop, but the doors opened on their own and there was some kind of thing standing on top of a structure just like this one. It said, it is done, and the whole structure filled with fire. That's quite a story, Moo. Your chief medical officer will confirm it. The only reason either of us are still here is because whatever decapitated my sentry marine missed us. Everything was on fire. It was like some kind of prehistoric religious ritual. Zoni didn't say a word. It was clear by the look on her face she would have preferred a different conversation subject. The captain's comlink beeped. He activated it while he continued examining the unusual modifications to Dunbrody's lab space. Hunter. All the transfers are complete. Your new helpers are standing by in auxiliary engineering. Rebecca and I are ready to depart. Stay out of sight, Jace. That Sarn base is way over our heads until we get some more tonnage. We've only been ordered to evacuate survivors. I'm not planning on starting any fights. That's what I'm afraid of. See you soon, Captain. Psyche out. I'd feel better if we could send more ships, Zoni said. If only we had more crews with subspace combat experience. Hunter replied. Better to just get the rest of the personnel the hell out of there and come back later with more rifles. Moo, what about the thing standing on the structure? What species was it? Hunter asked. It could have been human. The convection distortions in the air made it difficult to see clearly. When those doors opened, all the gases poured out into the corridor. We couldn't see anything after that. The colonel's voice sounded more than a little exhausted, as if the memory of the incident reminded him of how powerless his boarding detail seemed. Hunter took another look around. What about the crew? Aside from the three security personnel we saw on San Cristobal, there were no other humans aboard. 
everything else we encountered was decidedly non-human. But also not a species we've encountered before, Zoni offered. Hartz ran the readings through her exobiology computers several times, Mu replied. Nothing recognizable came back. We got some basic information about metabolism, oxygen utilization, body mass, and so on. But there isn't enough there to even take a guess as to where they came from or what they were doing there. Any luck? The new voice belonged to Kala Zio, captain of the Valiant. She was dressed in her fleet blue camo fatigues. Her long, bouncy hair was light blue and wasn't shifting colors as it normally would for a Jash woman. Her voice was just as festive-sounding as Zoni's, even though her bearing was all business. It's going to take more than a little detective work to figure out what our new opponents were up to aboard these ships, Commander, Hunter replied. So far, all we've managed to do is find more questions and no answers to go with them. Here's another piece of the puzzle, then, Kala replied, producing her own atmos. Analysis indicates all of the ships in the Task Force 156 formation contained oxygen levels that were a good 16% higher than normal life support tolerances. Aboard Troina and Olacox, the levels went as high as 27%. There's your fireworks show, Zoni quipped. Might as well have left the stove on. Once again, we have a question with no answer. Or we have an answer, but it doesn't make sense, Mu replied. Why would the life support systems allow oxygen levels to get that out of whack? Maybe the life support systems weren't able to shut down the source of the excess, Zoni replied. They would have compensated, Hunter said. But only to a point, sir, Kala countered. Without the proper overrides, standard life support tolerances won't allow saturation equilibrium to drop below about 180 parts per thousand. If it goes lower than that, the hard filters engage. Either that or the deck alert systems go off, Mu added. Environmental control, engineering, and the bridge would have gotten numerous warnings. If the numbers got too far off, there would have been a decompression alarm. Hunter looked around again, playing his light along the conduits bolted into the Dunbrody's overhead reinforcement beams. Maybe they were preoccupied. Sir? Mu had a feeling the captain would be the one to suggest something completely outside the baseball diamond. And once again... He was right. How distracted would we have to be to ignore a life support event? About as distracted as the crew of the Sussex, sir, Kala offered. Hunter turned without saying a word and pointed at the unusual-looking young commander, then made an encouraging victory gesture. Like I've always said, Colonel, mystery solving is nine parts connecting dots and one part luck, or in this case, one part jash. Kala glanced at Zoni. Both women kept quiet. What happens when I take all the water vapor out of the air, Colonel? Hunter asked, climbing up one side of the altar. Saturated oxygen levels drop, but... Hunter made a slow-down gesture with one hand as he continued navigating the steps built into the towering structure. Agreed. Oxygen levels rose this time, but if I can remove oxygen from the air, I can add it too, right? Especially if I think like a heretic. Captain Weiss and her crack scientific team discovered these guys are so good at physics they can warp the fundamentals of the weak force. How hard would it be for them to change the molecular content of a ship's atmosphere? All due respect, sir, that's starting to sound like hocus-pocus, Kala said. Hunter finally made it to the top of the altar. But hocus-pocus is exactly what these guys do, Captain. They're building temples in our ships. We can't pretend to be surprised they are also magicians. Are you planning to start a new church, sir? I can't say I disapprove of the view from above, Colonel, Hunter replied as he posed with fists on hips. Makes me look all the more mystical. You're starting to sound a little zealous, sir, Zoni said. Fear not, Commander, Hunter said as he bounded down the opposite set of steps. I'm not planning to start any inquisitions. At the same time, we've got another piece of data to hand over to the doctor. One way or another, we're going to find out what happened aboard these starships before we arrived at Core 7. That's encouraging. Another new voice. This time, it was none other than Jocelyn Weiss. Captain, what brings you to the Church of Anomalous Oxygen Levels? Hunter roared. Your frigate captain sent us those images you pulled from orbit at Core 7. Weiss waved her digital tablet in the air to draw attention to the new data. Remember that house on the planet's surface? Turns out you've seen it before. None of the assembled officers spoke at first. Finally, Zoni asked the obvious question. Where? Through the looking glass over Raleo 2. 
The optical data is a pixel-for-pixel -pixel match at every resolution and observation angle. Not only was that house not there, according to the laws of temporal mechanics, it never existed in our timeline at all. It was last seen and last photographed by the starship Psy Key more than 500 years ago. Chapter 6 The Imperial Blade was known throughout the Sarn fleet as the very sword of the Emperor himself. Its officers were elite, ruthless, bloodthirsty, and unmatched in both interstellar strategy and brute strength. They held the fiery ideal of the dragon rampant as their highest ambition. They sought to remake themselves and the Empire itself in the very image of their winged ancestors. Fourth Cloud Dragon Gurgle A. Shen was second in his line to reach for the stars. His was a black-scaled brood, known for its belligerent claims on the wealth of foreign patriarchs. Through guile and sudden violence, his sires had amassed considerable influence. When his brother was chased down and murdered as reprisal for his condemned father's last series of hostile acts against a noble house, Gurgle found himself entrusted with his line's entire legacy. He traded the valor his family had won for a commission as Talon. His first post was command of a ten-dragon watch guarding one of the Empire's hallowed forges. Gurgle thwarted an attempt to raid an Imperial armory, leading his squad-sized unit against forces with a nearly three-to-one advantage in worms. Nine traitors were vanquished for every sword Gurgle lost. He was swiftly promoted to Fire Talon and reassigned to the Emperor's Blade Fleet. The legend that grew around him took full advantage of the Sarn reverence for the number nine. Gurgle became known as the Dragon Who Slew Nine with One Blade. It wasn't long before Gurgle had accumulated a reputation built on his rather checkered service record. Although he had lost at least one command and nearly lost a second, his unorthodox and altogether bizarre combat tactics against the enemies of Galefos were the subject of constant study by the finest minds in the modern military ranks. The Butcher, as he had come to be known, was credited with the outright capture of no fewer than three enemy starships and the destruction of a fourth. He had brought more than a thousand prisoners before the Crown and claimed at least one of the planets in the Prairie Grove system for the Empire during the First Praetorian War, where he won his white wings and gained the privilege of being addressed as Cloud Dragon from then on. The Sarn captain was an enigma to his crew, his officers, and his own people. He eschewed the spotlight, even though the Empire was eager to celebrate him. He plotted constantly, but not against other officers. His only concern was accidental interference with his precisely considered plans. Now, those plans were being put to the test as part of the Emperor's overall goal. Some considered it conquest. Others believed it was payback for so many years of mistreatment by a stronger foe. For Gurgle the Butcher, it was an opportunity to advance his house and entrench the interests of his descendants, should he ever return home to sire them. His ship was the Imperial Blade Cruiser Zalo. She was among the fastest of the Imperial heavy hulls, and she had been attentively honed into a fearsome weapon by the Butcher and his hand-picked officers' corps. Zelo was home to refits and weapons modifications even the fleet's most forward-thinking engineers wouldn't have recognized. Her officers and crew saw her as the wings of the twilight perch, which was Sarn poetry for the dragon who perched high and at a distance, ever watchful and mindful of its obligation to protect its house. Zalo frequently swooped down upon its enemies in a manner quite reminiscent of its blood-winged creators and the feral species that gave them life. The primeval instincts of the dragon race infused everything they built and every tactic they employed against their enemies, and those instincts had found expression in the sharp edges of the Butcher's warship. This was among the many reasons the Emperor and his advisors simply could not allow the outcome of First Praetorian to stand. Even among Apex Predators, None could challenge a creature that could take flight and rain down fire upon its enemies. It was one of the key pillars of the Sarn self-image that none but a titan from beyond space and time could conceivably grapple with a dragon and hope to survive. And yet, only a few years ago, stories of a hairless, fangless, tiny creature that had likely descended from fruit-eating apes had reached the ears of all but a scarce few of dragonkind. The monkey men, as they had come to be known, and their sorcerous females, Sarn called monkey witches, had done what even the hand servants of he who flew upon great wings could not. But those days were over. Now it fell to he who slew nine and others like him to teach humanity a lesson in true barbarism.
It was said humans were born upon a bed of green grass and fed until they were too fat to walk. Meanwhile, dragonkind fought their way to survival from the very moment they sundered the shells of their eggs. This time, the species that fought hardest for survival would prevail. The law of who was the stronger would not permit any other outcome. I am told you have put away your stories of the humans and their so-called strength and replaced them with tales of our future glory. Most of the crew knew their captain's voice well. One thing the Cloud Dragon assiduously attended to was his camaraderie with the dragons who served the Empire with him. After all, it was they who would eventually meet the accursed humans in battle. They could not be expected to prevail if they were confused about their place in the fleet. The Zelo analyst Gurgul confronted was a mere eighth scale. At best, he was present to provide only facts without the egocentric editorial that so often followed bold pronouncements by Imperial officers. Naturally, the captain considered such traditions dangerous, as it was often the least among warriors who pointed out the flaw in his superior's thinking. Despite talk and more talk by so-called warriors who believed tall tales could supplant true victories, occasionally there were words worth hearing. It was up to blade officers to separate one from the other. It was not often that an elite Talon and Starship commander would allow such heinous ideas to take hold among inferior officers and crew, of course. The line between advice and rebellion was blurred enough as it was, and it was not lost on the most lethal members of His Majesty's military that anyone crossing that line had the capacity to dispense considerable wrath to back up their opinions, right or wrong. The Sarn were not shy about backing up their challenges. All that said, it was the Butcher who wanted to hear all voices before committing his worms to the attack. After what had taken place among the stars during First Praetorian, it was up to the captains of His Majesty's fleet to make certain no such defeat ever flourished again. It was clear to the Sarn strategists their opponent was unlikely to be bested by a run-of-the-mill battle plan when such plans had produced nothing but disaster up to now. The analyst did not answer right away. He simply replaced the star map on the screen with an image of Skywatch Hull number BBV740 with a cutout depicting one of her gunships and all the attendant tactical analysis available to the Empire. The Zelo's other officers were gathered around what they called the Warlord's Table. They regarded the spacecraft schematic silently, as hesitant to offer opinions as Gurgle's studious assistant. Speak. The reason for the order was not hard to discern. Time was of the essence. The Butcher did not long abide those unwilling to stand upon their oaths. She is out of our class, said Stone Talon Remisk, even if we ignore her strike wing and her amphibious units. Zelo's captain waited. Remisk's evaluation was the safe play. It was the thing to say since it was on everyone's mind. They were the words of an officer trying to avoid disagreement and displeasing his captain. Of course, Argent was out of their class. She was a battleship while Zelo was only a cruiser. The two ships served different purposes and had entirely different objectives and battle tactics. In a one-to-one -one matchup, the Skywatch vessel would inevitably prevail, even if she were heavily damaged in the engagement. But the new reality of Sarn war-making invited its adherents to stop thinking in such linear, straightforward terms. One might as well have simply conceded and gone home to sulk and quietly await old age and regret. What faced the mighty warriors of the Blade was a simple and altogether harrowing imperative. They had to win despite their disadvantage. The Sarn had discovered what humans had counted on for centuries. There is no such thing as a fair fight. Someone always had an advantage whether it be weight or speed or opportunity. Almost the entirety of Terran culture was infused with the archetype of he who won despite a disadvantage. In fact, the ones who beat the odds were often revered in direct proportion to how steep the odds actually were. It was an odd way to look at the universe until one truly regarded the creatures doing the looking. Humans were not physically impressive, nor were they particularly likely to seek mortal warfare as a first option. But they were incredibly curious, and once they believed they had found an answer, or even something as simple as a single clue, they were among the most industrious species in known space. Where the Sarn still relied on their physical gifts, humans crafted tools. Where dragonkind preferred instinct, mankind turned to insight. The monkey men were almost magical in their ability to come up with a decisive invention at the least strategically convenient moment. It was that eventuality that gnawed at the Blade's officers. 
They knew deep in their savage hearts those diabolical apes would only join battle if there was at least one hidden snare set for their enemy. This time Dragonkind would be ready. Finally, Gurgle spoke. If a larger and stronger worm lay hands on your female, do you return to your cave with excuses about who belongs in what class? Remisk stared. Rhetorically speaking, he was inches away from being impaled on his own war knife. It remained to be seen if any of the other senior officers aboard the butcher's ship were bold enough to say things that others wouldn't accept at face value. Dosh, do you agree with the Stone Talon's assessment? I do not, Cloud Dragon. What is your evaluation of this opponent? Gurgle asked. His tone made it clear he would tolerate no further safe opinions. The long banners of past victories hung from the ceiling, circling the room and its occupants. It was clear the ghosts who had won those victories were unlikely to disagree with Gurgle's unspoken code. It matters not the size of his ship any more than it matters the size of my prey, Cloud Dragon. A skilled worm's blade will still find his enemy's neck. I propose we drop our drive field and ram her bridge at maximum possible velocity. The other officers looked as if they had just been asked to drink rotting cattle eggs. A grin slowly crept across the butcher's face. Sacrifice his majesty's finest cruiser to defeat one of his most elusive and troublesome enemies? Dosh didn't miss a beat. It would be a great victory, sir. It would also leave Siege Island with no deployable capital platforms, and it would put relentless pressure on the human fleet to reinforce Core 7. Radiation would rain from their skies for years. How do you believe it would affect the humans and their morale? Her fighters and gunships would be vaporized at once. The shock of it would reach their president's throat. If they didn't immediately sue for peace, the momentum would carry us all the way to Core 3 and possibly beyond. The captain began to pace around the oval-shaped officers' conference. Like all Imperial warships, Zelo was equipped with a chieftain's table made of Gyalfos stone for it was upon such a table the first spoils of Sarn conquest were divided. Gurgle's cape swept the air gently as he walked. The flecks of silver and adamant in its many scales caught what little light was in the chamber, causing it to sparkle as brightly as the edge of the blooded blade at his side. These dragons are the words of courage we have allowed to atrophy in our hallowed circles. They are the kinds of words that were once spoken by the light of a cooking fire on a sacred night. They were the heart of our resolve. They made our carved and seared portions taste better. The butcher stopped at the head of the room, blocking his officer's view of their enemy's mighty battleship. What are we if we fail to accept the challenge of our enemy? Cowards, Dosh replied, again without hesitation. Exactly. We will face the human on his own soil, and we will take from him that which he cannot bear to lose. We will fight past his armor and his swords, we will burn his fighters out of the skies, and when there is naught left but ash and sorrow, we will take back what was stolen from us in the wars of treachery. Gurgle drew his knife in a lightning-quick gesture of aggressiveness and drove its pointed blade into the ceremonial wooden ritual tray on the circular stone table. The sound of metal against wood echoed like a rifle shot. It would have been lost on humans, but for a Sarn officer, the physical reactions of the other senior warriors in the room was telling. Their scales gradually took on a lighter color, and their nostrils flared. Several bared their teeth. It was a reaction born a hundred million years in the past, on the shores of a river of molten earth, but it was burned into their blood as surely as their claws and dorsal scales. Several rose, looming over the table with rapacious glares, eager to join the hunt, confident in their new sense of victory. Now, the butcher hissed, who among you is worthy to fight by my side?